today to lift our praises to you. Lord, would you be blessed with the words of our mouth and the meditations of our heart as we sing to you. Would you just speak through Pastor Daniel this morning? We just thank you and praise you for who you are. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen.
We've been working through Ephesians now for, for a, a few months, and now uh, we will wrap that up in the next couple of weeks today. Uh, and then next week, our, our final message in the series on bodybuilding, as we have been focusing on the building up of the church, the, the bodybuilding that is our spiritual development as individuals and also collectively as a, as a church. And, and in the last few weeks, beginning at Ephesians chapter 5, we've been dealing with relationships. It started out in Ephesians talking very generally what has been done in us as believers as a result of what God has done, as a result of, of Jesus and the cross, and where we find ourselves as, as believers, the foundation that makes it possible for us to, to grow in our relationship with Christ. And then as we as we've moved along, the, 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 the teaching has become more and more practical, it's become more and more pointed uh, to the individual. And so we looked at, we've been looking at some relationship kind of issues. And last week we talked about husbands and wives. We talked about the responsibilities of parents, the responsibilities of, of, of children. And now we're going to continue in, in really that same theme of relationships today. And it's a little different. And it's the relationship, referring to the relationship between slaves and masters. And, and before, you, before you tune that out, before you, you think, you know what, since I'm not a slave owner, and since I'm not a slave, this probably isn't going to apply to me. I want to, I want to caution you that, 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 that you are in reality in a, a, a slave-master relationship today. As we, we consider the, the scriptural uh, picture of a slave and a master from the, from the Bible times, from the Roman world, it's, it's a little different than what we think of today when we think of slave and master. Our, of course, our, our view is, 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 is altered by our, the reality of slavery that we had here in the United States, which was based on a, a, a pretty much a, a predominantly a racial uh, motivation, and, and it, was, it was people who were, were captured and, and taken to, brought to our country in order to serve as slaves. And that isn't identically the picture that we get from the Roman world. That wasn't exactly the, as they had slave and, and master relationships. In fact, just to kind of give you some background on that, though there were some cases where slavery resulted from maybe a nation conquering another nation and taking their people as their slaves, most of the time, slavery in that part of the world, at that time of the world, was, a, was an economic arrangement, oftentimes even instituted by the, or initiated by the slave themselves. And so, oftentimes, because of, of just hardship, economic hardship, because of debt that they couldn't pay, people would be forced into a, a slave arrangement. And what would happen would oftentimes be something like this. I, I can't make my payments. I can't feed my family. And so I, I would approach somebody who was wealthy and I would say, look, I want to make an arrangement. I, I will become your slave. I will, I will work for you. you. You will own me until I have paid off my debt, until my family is, has been cared for. And, and generally, there was a limited time to that. It would be over a period of time before it was, it was completed. And so... It, so to, to think of it as we think of slavery today, it wasn't actually the, the identical thing. In fact, oftentimes children would end up in slavery. If, if a child was abandoned by his family, they couldn't, they couldn't feed them, they couldn't care for them, they didn't have the safety nets that we have in our society today. There, was no, there wasn't programs, government programs. A kid that couldn't be fed would often just be abandoned. And so someone would come along and they would say, see an economic opportunity, and they would take that child into their home, and, and, and they would become a slave to them. Oftentimes, they would adopt them into the family. But it, it, was, it was, and then the same thing had to do with families. Couldn't provide for their family. Couldn't feed their family. And so they would actually sell their child into slavery. And we would look at it and think, oh my goodness, that's horrific. How could anyone do that? But oftentimes, that would be taken, uh, the other alternative would be letting them die because I can't feed and provide for them. So oftentimes, that was the, that's kind of the background, background for slavery as, as it's described in the Bible. The master-slave relationship. And, and today, probably a better comparison, a better, better description for that, for us as we try to understand this, is, is an employer-employee relationship. Now you might think, man, I'm not a slave to my... But, but in reality, it's, it's a closer picture than it is when we think about the slavery that, that was in our country in the, in the 1800s. And we're going we're gonna to take a look at that today and, 
and, and the, the picture that it gives to us when, when, when Paul wrote this letter and he's saying this is how the, the master-slave relationship should be carried out. These are the requirements. These are the responsibilities that I've given to you as a slave, as an employee. These are the responsibilities I've given to you as the master or as an employer. And, and the, the truth is that if we as Christians, if we as a church truly adhered to these principles, if we really, really applied them in our life, it would, it would be an incredible testimony to the world. Because it would be so much different if we had Christians working for us than it would if we had non-Christians working for us. It would be so much different if we had a, a Christian boss as opposed to a non-Christian boss. But the truth is, you can't really tell the difference very much in the world today. And I want to challenge us today as we, as we look at this scripture to be challenged to the words that Paul gave to the Ephesians. That, that, that there, is, there should be a different look to the Christian worker, to the Christian employee. We've been having problems with our, our projector over here, and we've made arrangements to get that looked at, but you guys are probably going to have to try to look in here off this this, this morning. Uh, but, but anyway, we're going to look at Ephesians chapter 6, beginning at verse 5, and if you want to look at that this morning, we'll read those five verses. Slaves, obey your earthly masters with respect and fear and with sincerity of heart, just as you would obey Christ. Obey them not only to win their favor when their eye is on you, but as slaves of Christ, doing the will of God from your heart. Serve wholeheartedly as if you were serving the Lord, not people, because you know that the, that the Lord will reward each one of you, each one for whatever good they do, whether they are free or slave. And masters, treat your slaves in the same way. Do not threaten them, since you know that he who is both their master and yours is in heaven, and there is no favoritism with him. Let's bow for a word of prayer. Father, we thank you this morning that we have this privilege, this opportunity to open your word. And I pray, Lord, this morning that you would just prepare us in every way. I pray, God, that you would remove the distractions, that you would remove those things that would take our mind off the truth of your word, that, that those things that might get in the way from us hearing from you this morning, Lord, you would just take care of. I pray, God, that you would speak through me, that you would give me the words to speak that would be the, the truth of your scripture and not my own ideas. And I pray, God, foremost, that we will be changed as a result of our encounter with the word this morning, that, God, it would take hold of our life and it would transform us. And as this morning we consider the employer, the employee relationship, I pray God that you would make us the godly employees and employers that you would want us to be. We just thank you. We look forward to this time. We pray these things all in Jesus name. Amen. We're going to look at what are the responsibilities this morning of the, of the Christian employee and the Christian employer. And, and I want you to think about, why, you know, why would God take time in his word and take space in his word to, to address this? It doesn't seem like it would be that big of an issue. There's a lot of other things that maybe he could talk about in our relationships. But he decided to talk about this master-slave relationship. So it must be important. Well, think about this. You will spend one quarter of your adult life at work. One quarter of your adult life will be spent... In, in around those people that you work with. You, you, when you compare that to the fact that one-third of your adult life is going to be spent sleeping, and some of you have been able to combine the two of those. <laughs> but, but, but the truth is, it, predominantly, just from a, 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 a time issue, we, a lot of our life is, is, is comprised of being at work, of being around the people that we work with. We have in a working relationship with, with our peers, with our, our, our supervisors, whoever it might be. But it, it eats up a bunch of our day, right? It's a, it's a major part of our life. In fact, if you talk to men, you just start having a discussion with men before they start talking about how many kids they have, before they start talking about, about uh, even sports, they're probably going to tell you what they do for a living. Because that's oftentimes where we, we receive a, a great amount of our identity as people. And so it is incredibly important in our life. And it's incredibly important in our life as a Christian. And, and not only is it important just because it takes up a lot of our time, 
It's also a, a great opportunity for us to, to, to demonstrate the reality of Christ in our life. You will live your faith in front of your employee, your employers and your employees, your, your peers every day. In fact, it's going to be an, an, a great testimony. People who see you at work see you in a way that people at church don't see you. They see you with, with a lot of the, the pretense stripped off, down to the real you. And so, and so God has specifically addressed that. He's talked to us and said, you know what? As an employer, as an employee, you, you need to look different. You need, to be, you need to be standing out in the crowd that is the, the rest of your workmates. And so it becomes a great opportunity for us to, to live out the reality of our faith. To demonstrate the reality of, of Jesus in our life. And, and so we're going to look at that this morning. You know, probably one of the greatest places of the testing of your faith is going to be in the workplace. You can, it's easy to come here on Sunday morning to worship together, to, to sing to the Lord, to listen to the teaching, to, to uh, do all the things we do together on Sunday morning. But on Monday morning, when you, when you walk into that workplace, your, your faith is going to be tested in a, in, a, in a much more difficult way. And it's going to also be an opportunity for you to demonstrate that faith to other people. So what is the responsibility of the Christian employee? Well, if we look at, at, at uh, Ephesians chapter 6, six the first thing is this, that, that the Christian employee should display obedience. Now that sounds kind of like Wait, wait a second. I'm losing this already. I got to obey my boss? What do you think about it? That's really the whole point of being there. He's going to lay it out. This is what I expect of you. This is what I want you to do. What is your responsibility? Not to argue with him. Not to say, I got a better way. It's really to do what he has instructed you to do. Obedience is, is the, first, the first requirement is listed. Years ago when I was working for a little construction company in Huntingdon. And I, my boss had given me an instructions. He said he wanted me to go do a specific thing and wait there until he arrived. And I sat there for a good part of the afternoon, sat through lunch and it was early into the afternoon. I finally like, you know what? This is silly. I, I'll just head back to the job that I was working on before and, and just help out there. So I went back. Well, about 4, 4.30, he comes pulling in. And I could see as soon as he got out of the vehicle, he was not happy with me. And he said, what are you doing here? And I said, and this is all I got out of my mouth. I said, well, I thought, and he, that was all he wanted to hear. He said, I'm not paying you to think. <laughs> and, and, and why was he upset? Was he was upset at me because he had given me specific instructions. This is I want, what I want you to do. And I didn't do that. And so, and so... He, it, it, was, it was actually a big, big point in my life because I realized, you, you're right, he wasn't paying me to think. And, and, uh, and it wasn't too long before I had moved on in my career. But, but, the, but, but, but anyway, there was, there was truth in that. He, 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 he had specific expectations for me and that was what I should be doing. And, and as an employee, that's your responsibility. To, to listen to what your, your supervisor, your boss tells you, and to do it. Now, we should never, and I'll go back to a verse I used last week, it is better to obey God than to obey man. If, if your supervisor somehow tells you to do something that, is, it, that goes contrary to what God has told you, obviously you don't do that. Other than that, what's your responsibility? It's, it's obedience. It's to listen to the instructions that your supervisor has given you and, and, to, and to fall through on those. And what is the motivation? Well, take a look at, at, at Ephesians chapter 6. The motivation is respect and fear is what it says. And you might say this, you know what? I don't respect my boss. He's a jerk. You know what? Respect in, in the employer-employee relationship is not something that's to be earned. It's something that you're supposed to do. It is not your responsibility to, to feel at the boss, find out if you like your boss, and then demonstrate, demonstrate respect to which he has earned from you. No, the Bible says you respect him because of the position that he's, he's been placed in or she has been placed in. 
You're, you are commanded with respect and fear. Now think about it. If we hold those that are in a, a position above us in our employment in respect and fear, it's going to alter the way that we do our job. If, if, you, you, if you do not respect and you do not fear, then, then you're going to do whatever you want. But what the, the implication is, if I respect and I f- fear that person who is over me, I'm going to pay attention to detail. I'm going to be more concerned about doing it exactly as they have described to me as opposed to doing it in a way that I think would be best, in a way that would be maybe the easiest. I, I, it, it causes us to approach our job in a different way. Respect and fear brings an attention to detail. So I'm going to respond in the way that you want me to respond, not, not as I would want to. And... And as an employee today, God's directive to you is simply that. It's, it's obedience. You, you need to do what, what your, your supervisor has commanded for you to do. It, you know, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter if it's unreasonable. What matters is this is what God has said to do. It doesn't matter if it's uncomfortable, if it's difficult. God has said this is how you are supposed to interact with your uh, with your supervisor. The next thing that he points out that we're to do, the Christian employee should display sincerity. Now think about that, sincerity. What does that mean? Sincerity means there's no pretense. You are seeing the reality of who I am. I'm not putting on a show for you. I am, I am purely and, 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 and sincerely who you see that I am. Now, is that common in your workplace today? Probably not. There's, no, there's, there's this facade, I'm going to, to give you this picture of who you want to see, but I'm not going to really show you who I am. And yet it says that we are to be sincere. We put on this pretend smile, we put out these pretend efforts, but eventually the real you is going to shine through. Eventually they're going to see who you are. And God says, be sincere. Be, be absolutely up front. And then he, he gives us the, the key to all of this. And he says this, he says, as if it were Christ. As you would if it were Christ, is what he's saying. Now, would that change the way that you do your job? That, that if, you, if you looked at your, your supervisor who has given you these responsibilities, who's given you this job to do, And if you were to think, okay, if Jesus were my supervisor, how would I do this job for him? He says, that's the way you do it. That as if Christ himself were the one that you were working for. And so whatever it is that you do today, if you're you're making widgets, you're making widgets for Jesus. If you're you're sweeping the floor, you're sweeping the floor for Jesus. Whatever it is, he says, as if you were doing it for Christ himself. No matter how important you might think your job is, no matter how unimportant you might think your job is, you do it as if you were doing it for Christ himself. And that would absolutely change the way the Christian would look in the workplace if, if that were the case, if that were the, the truth for us today. The next thing that he tells us is that the Christian employee should seek to please. Now think about that. In my workplace, in the past, we had a name for people who sought to please. And, and, and do you know what? They, they, because it was, they were based on what the boss saw. And so I seek to please the boss when the boss is watching. I seek to please. I do what the boss wants when his eyes are on me, is what the scripture says. But he says... Even when his eyes are not on you. Now think about it. If you are truly working to please the boss, you would work the same whether his eyes were on you or his eyes were off of you. Wouldn't make any difference. I'm working to please the boss. And yet, too many times in the workplace, whether we're a Christian or a non-Christian, we do what we think the boss wants us to see. And when he's looking the other way, that's when we got our feet up. That's when we're, we're, we're doing something completely different. Knowing that if he were present, he wouldn't be happy with me. But it doesn't matter because he's not present. And yet, for the Christian, the responsibility doesn't change when the boss leaves the room. 
and he goes back to this as if Christ himself were there. Now think about it. Christ's eyes are there. So when you're doing your, your work, when you are employed on the job, when you're working, whether or not the boss is visible, whether he sees you or not, it makes no difference. You're working for Jesus and he sees you. You know, on uh, our leadership meeting the other night, we met and, and we were just kind of sitting around the table talking before. And in the five or 10 minutes prior to the beginning of the meeting, two people said this, man, I almost quit my job this week. Two people, I won't even mention their names, but they, they brought up problems they faced at work, challenges that they faced that, that brought them to the point of, you know what, I don't even want to deal with this anymore. And you know what, it, it shouldn't make any difference. It shouldn't make any difference if the boss sees us or not. We're working for Christ. Our job, we're doing the job to the best of our ability is if Jesus himself were standing there alongside us, working for him. We worked to please our supervisor, but ultimately we worked to, to please God himself, to please Jesus. And finally, he says this, or I shouldn't say finally, but the next point is this, as that the Christian should serve with enthusiasm. Now I want to ask you, do you convey enthusiasm to your boss? Did, when you walk in the door, is, is your boss going, man, I'm telling you, I, I love seeing him come in the door because I know he is ready to jump in it. He's ready to do whatever we need to do here today. You know, I, I, I worked in, in management. I, I was a supervisor. I know that that's not the typical employee. The typical employee is trying to do just what they got to do to get by. Just enough to, to stay on the payroll. Just to, to keep the boss off their back. And yet, Jesus, through, through speaking through Paul, said that you should be working at this, this wholeheartedly. There should be a passion and an excitement when you go to work. And why? He goes back to it again. Because you are, in a sense, working for Jesus you know, whatever it is you're doing, you're doing it for Christ. No matter what, what it is, no matter how important or unimportant you might think, you're, you're doing it for Christ. You are doing it to, for, for his glory and for, for his purposes. And, and, and instead, we go and we, we start working and it doesn't suit us. It's uncomfortable. It's irritating. The boss is unreasonable. And so soon, our, maybe the, the passion that we started out with becomes a little tepid. Soon, we're, we're just barely getting by, hardly putting any effort into it. And yet, Paul says, for the Christian employer, or the Christian employee, you should be working at this wholeheartedly, passionately, giving all that you have for the work, as though you were working for the Lord himself. And then he says this, if I ask you today um, why you continue to work, if I were to go out into the community or just everyone in church and say, why do you continue doing your job? I, I'm, I'm guessing that 95 to 99% of you would say, because it's payday. I'm, I'm not going to do this if, if somebody doesn't pay me. That's the only reason I'm here is payday. And yet in, in, the, in the letter that Paul writes to the Ephesians, he indicates something else. Keep doing this because there is a heavenly payday. There is a heavenly reward that comes for you to you for faithfully being the employee that Christ has called you to be. Now, we don't think of that, do we? We don't really think about the, the association of our efforts on the job with our reward. Now, it, it doesn't say specifically heavenly reward, but it does say a reward. That could mean in heaven, it could mean here. There could be benefits, and I think there will be benefits, as you, as a Christian, obediently follow the directives of God regarding your place of employment. There's going to be tangible earthly benefits as a result of that. And, and that, you know what? That should result in, in employers fighting to get Christian employees. Think about it. If, if Christian employer, employees all look like this, if Christian employees all followed this pattern, compared to the world, compared to the, the reality of the workplace today, 
Christian employers would be like, man, I got to get me, I mean, not Christian employees, employees would say, I got to get me some Christians because they do their job completely different than the rest of the world. And yet the truth is that they can't see a difference because there isn't a difference. We're looking just like the rest of the world. We fall right into the, the whiny, complainy, just put our time in, go home, employees that the rest of the world is. And yet it would be, they would be fighting over us. The, the, the unemployment rate for Christians would be 0%. Because Christians are such amazing employees, we got to get them. You know, if you followed football at all and watched the, the, the Tim Tebow thing this year, the quarterback for Denver Broncos, he's a, a very committed Christian, and he has taken a beating from the, from the media and the press for displaying his faith in public. They, there's just an absolute hatred that, that, is, that is extended towards him. I mean, I, you can't call it anything else than that hatred. And you, and you know what? They can't say anything because he keeps winning games. It doesn't matter. They can, they can complain all they want. But, but, but as long as they're winning games, they, they, you know, he's going to have a job. And, and that's the, the picture of the, of the Christian. Do your job to the best of your ability. Pour yourself into it. Be the, the greatest employee that you can be and, and you know what? Not only are you going to look good, God's going to look good. And so, and so, pour yourself wholeheartedly, completely. Now, I'm not saying that, that there won't be persecution that maybe comes your way. As people in the workplace know that you're a believer, you're a follower of Christ, that might set you up for, for some, some pain, for some ridicule. But, but the truth is that if we as Christians followed the words that Paul wrote to the Ephesian church, we would look so different that, that, that people would, would be knocking each other over to get Christians to work for them. And so, and so when, when we consider these commands, I want you to think of the implications if Christians truly followed this today. What would be the effect in the world? Well, well, first of all, I think it would have a, an incredible in, impact on the productivity of our country. But beyond that, it would be an incredible testimony to the world. The rest of the world would be looking at the, the, the work ethic, looking at the, the diligence, the, the, the faithfulness of, of, the, of the Christian employee and, and, and who would get the glory? Who would get the recognition? It would be God himself. It is a, an amazing opportunity for us as Christians to make a testimony to the world. You might say, you know what? I'm not a very good preacher. I can't get up and talk in front of people. I can't teach a Sunday school class. I, I'm, I'm, I'm really limited. You know what? If you go to your workplace and you do the best possible job that you can do, as Paul describes here, you are going to preach a sermon. You are going to make a testimony to other people because someone's going to say, you know, why is this, is this guy, why is this girl like so much, so beyond what my other employees are? And it's, it's because of Christ. It's because of Jesus. And, and as a result of that, um, you have just made a testimony to the reality of God in your life, the reality of, of Christ in your life. Paul then moves on to the master after the slaves, which probably most of us more identify with the slave. But some of you are in, in positions of authority in your workplace. Some of you supervise people. Um, and, and he has recommendations to the employer too, beginning uh, in, in verse 9. And he begins with this. He's saying in the same way, it's like ditto. You know the things I just told you? You know, same thing again to you. Copy and paste. Just take those things I told you in the verse 5, put them into verse 9. You, you need to apply those truths to him. What he's saying is this, that in the same way that you as the employee's efforts have been shaped by the relationship with Christ, for the employer, your relationship with Christ is going to shape the way that you do your job and the way that you deal with other people. It's going to, it's going to have an impact on who, how you serve, how you work, in the workplace and your expectations for your employees. In fact, it should completely change the way you interact with employees. If, if you are not applying these principles, you're in the same way 
making a testimony, to, a testimony about God in your workplace that is not going to be very complimentary of God. I mean, you've had those kind of employer, employers, right? With unrealistic expectations, harsh, mean, vindictive. Do you really want to work for those people? Why in the world would we, as a Christian, exemplify that kind of behavior in our life? And Paul says that the reality of Jesus in your life should change the way that you deal with those people that are, are, are working with you. In the same way that bosses should be hiring to, or should be fighting to hire Christian employers, um, we should be fighting over finding Christian bosses. Because, because they, they, they are the kind of people you want to work for. And, and he begins with this, he says, even specifically, he says, don't, don't threaten them. Don't put a threat over these people. Don't threaten to, to harm them. There, there should be a gentleness in the way that you deal with people. It should be a gentleness that, that it is evident to, to everyone. I, one, of the, my, the, the, one of the supervisors in my life that had the, the greatest impact on me. I, I was just out of college. I was working at Hershey Medical Center and they had this, this uh, supervisor in our, in our department that was a Mennonite, a very godly Christian man. And, and he demonstrated a gentleness, a, a respect, a, just a, a, a concern for those that worked for him that made me want to do well for him. It made me want to please him. I, I want to do my best because, because of, of, of the way that he treats me. And, and yet oftentimes we as Christians can, can be just as, as mean and, and, and downright nasty as, as the, the most vile heathen. And yet we should, as, a, as an employer, as a supervisor, you should look completely different. And you know what? When, when people are treated with that, they respond in kind to that. People will respond to that kind of treatment in their own life. And, and God tells us that, Paul tells us this, and he says that he doesn't have a favorite. You need to Think about this. If you're a boss, if you own your own company, if you, are, uh, if you have climbed the ladder in your department, Jesus pretty much, if I can paraphrase verse 9, he says this, you know what? God's not impressed with that. God's not really impressed with how you have climbed the ladder. In fact, he doesn't favor you any more than the lowest person on the totem pole. The, 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 the lowest position in, in your workplace, God doesn't view him any less than the CEO. He is not one who respects one over the other. He views us all the same. And, and one of the greatest reminders to us to keep us humble is that God is not impressed with your, your position. He has, in fact, placed you there for a reason in order to demonstrate Jesus to the world. He has given you a platform, an opportunity to, to show the reality of Christ in your life, in your workplace. And, and in the same way, he has given that person who's doing the most menial task in your workplace that opportunity also. And we need to, to understand that, that what you do as an employer, as an employee, is going to be an incredible opportunity to proclaim Jesus to, to others who don't know Jesus. You know, you, you can probably look around and just sit here and think, and you can think people in your workplace, and, and you can think of, of maybe they're, 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 they're apart from Christ. They, they don't know God, and you, you've even tried to consider how you could be a testimony to them. You maybe tried to think of how I can invite them to church, or I, I would say, here, here's where you begin. You start living out the description of a Christian employee. You begin demonstrating those qualities in your life. You begin living that character in your life. And, and, and you are going to stand out. You're going to have the opportunity to make a testimony of who Jesus is. Because he has completely changed you. He has taken the, 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 the if I can say it, the, the lazy, corrupt person that I am and he, he's made me into something different and that's a, a testimony to the world world you know never overlook the the power 
and the impact of your vocation for the cause of Christ. We have a tendency to compartmentalize, to separate. I live my, my faith. I come on Sunday morning. I even live my faith in my home. And then those eight hours, those eight hours out of the day, I'm going to set those aside. That's purely my vocation. That's purely my time of work. And yet, Paul says that you can't separate them. That they, they go together no matter what. Follow the commands of God and be the best employer that you can be. Follow the commands of God and be the best employee you can be. And you will be strengthened in your walk with God. We as a church will be strengthened in, in, in our, our mission for God. And, and the cause of Christ will be carried forward. Let's pray together. Father God, we thank you this morning. I, I thank you, Lord, that, that you chose to speak to us about our vocations. That, God, you chose to, to, to speak very directly and, and maybe in a, in a difficult way for us to even understand. But, but, Lord, our workplace is our mission field. Our workplace is that place where we can proclaim the reality of Jesus, if not with our words, with our actions. I pray, God, today for us as a church that if we struggle in our work, if we are discouraged, if we are just trudging along, that, Lord, we would embrace the truth in this letter from Paul and begin to, to experience our vocation the way that you would want us to. And, Lord, if we as a, an employer have been not demonstrating the, the Christ-like qualities, that, Lord, you would also help us to do that. Lord, as we close our time together today, just minister to us in whatever way is needed. And, and we thank you for that. And we pray these things all in Jesus' name. Amen. Would you all stand? <clears throat> encourage you to, to contemplate, to think about, to reflect on your own workplace. And I want you to think about the, the way that you are going about that. And I want you to compare that to, to the truth of Scripture. And, and just in, in your heart and your mind as we close today, to, to, are you that godly Christian employer, employee that God has called you to be? And if not, then, then today you begin to truly seek to, to demonstrate that life as Christians and, and as workers.
enjoyed preaching through Ephesians. This has been such a blessing to me. And, and, and you know, whether or not uh, you, you have been blessed by it, regardless, I can tell you each week when I study and prepare these messages, I, I, God just blesses me in, in an incredible way. And I, I, I've really enjoyed this. And, and next week we're going to conclude this. And, and I want you to think about when you're on a, a bodybuilding or weight loss kind of program, you, find, you get to that point where you're finally in the shape you want to be in. And then, and then becomes the, the difficult part of maintaining that, of, of, of not losing the ground that you've gained. And, and today, we're going to, or next week, we're going to look at, at bodybuilding, a, a maintenance program, defending off the attacks of, 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 our, of our faith and, our, and our, our, uh, the gains that we've made with God. And I, and I, and I pray you'll be here to. To, to enjoy that, but but I have been so blessed as a result of this this series. God it is so good, and, and and when we study His Word in its entirety, in its context, and its truth, there is there is a life changing aspect to that, and, and I hope that, that you've experienced that to a certain degree this week. Let's pray together, Father. We thank you today that we have had this time in Your Word, and I pray God that we will be changed as a result of this. That God, we as employees and employers. We'll, we'll go into our workplace this week and God, we will serve in a way that you have, you have described to us, in a way that would, would, would be a blessing to you, in a way that would be a testimony to you, Lord. And, and we thank you. Go with us, guide our steps, and help us, Lord, to be the, the light that you called us to be. We thank you and we pray these things all in Jesus' name.